Welcome to today's event, everybody. My name is Sam Morgan. I'm your moderator for this morning's discussion on electric car ownership, which has been kindly organized by the EUC, the European Consumer Organization. Uh, today's proceedings will, will delve into the world of transport, uh, in particular, the climate aspects of mobility, and of course, how this all affects the consumer. Late last year, the European Commission uh, published its Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy, a broad vision aimed at cleaning up and improving transport across the board. Uh, it sets an objective of at least 30 million zero emission cars on our roads by 2030, uh, but it's nearly halfway through 2021. Last time I checked anyway. Uh, so there's not much time to waste. Uh, to achieve these uh, big decarbonization plans, uh, the commission is set to increase CO2 targets and standards, maybe include road transport in the emissions trading scheme uh, and invest a lot in alternative energy infrastructure for transport. What does all this mean for the everyday motorists, European consumers, you ask? Well, we will shortly hear some details about a new study uh, that throws some light uh, on the issue. Uh, but first, it is my great pleasure to introduce two speakers uh, that can take us through this far more expertly than I can. Uh, first, we have Monique Goya, uh, Director General of BEUC, uh, our host today. Uh, after Monique has given us her initial thoughts on today's topic, uh, we will also hear from Pascal Canfin, MEP and Chair of the European Parliament's Envy Committee, uh, for his perspective on the political context of the European Green Deal, which of course is the policy that underpins all of these efforts and all of these new policies. Um, so now I'll turn the floor over to Monique. Monique, the floor is yours. Give us your take on uh, what we can expect from today's event and the issues at stake. Yes. Thank you, Sam, and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to have so many of you uh, at this call, and it's a very important and a very, can I say, optimistic event because we have great results to share with you and uh, the way forward is, is, is bright, can I say so. Uh, so as Sam already mentioned, Berg and nine of its members have been working with Element Energy on a study on the financial impact of consumers switching to electric cars. And it's the total cost of ownership. So not only the purchase price, but also the running cost. So the total life cycle of a car, what is the financial impact if you go there, uh, if you go electric, if I can say so, and compared to other powertrains. We had done a previous study in 2016, but of course the situation was, it was already an optimistic uh, result, but the situation was totally different because at that time, I would not say electric cars were science fiction, but they were, uh, let's say limited to the wealthy or to the geek, but it was not really already, let's say a, a big mainstream market issue. While now we see that electric cars become more and more a true alternative. And, and that demonstrates two things. First of all, car makers who have been bashing electrification uh, have changed their attitude and are now really developing uh, electrification of their, of their fleet. So that's a good thing. But the second thing that it demonstrates is that a market in only a few years time can really switch to more sustainable solutions. And, and this is something that we need swift, quick, rapid changes in market structures, in market offers, so that we can uh, uh, succeed in the green transition. This is really very, very key. And how, how did that come? How did that quick change arrive? Well, of course, the car makers have changed attitude and policy towards rollout of electric cars, but this was only possible due to good regulation, smart regulation. It is because the entry of in force of the stricter CO2 emission standards that car makers were obliged to innovate and to develop uh, uh, electric cars in a much, let's say, at a much higher uh, level. Uh, however, we still see in the market that the perception is that electric cars are still only for the wealthier and that. Uh, the, the mass of consumers are not really uh, able to afford this. And we wanted to fact check this together with Element Energy and uh, with um, UFC Kushwazir also, who is going to present later the, uh, some of the results. And we have done it in nine countries. And I think it is important for me to, to mention the countries, just to, to show the high diversity of the countries that we checked. It's Belgium, Cyprus, France, Germany, Italy, Lithuania, Poland, Slovenia and Spain. So quite a large and diversified spectrum of consumer markets when it comes to cars. And it, what also has been checked is not only daily commuting, it's also the rural citizens, the, pen, uh, the, the pensioners, the part-time workers and the urban dwellers. The study also looks at electric cars and plug-in hybrids, hybrids which have been 
very often marketed as um, the compromise solution. And we also looked at e-fuels. And I must say, the results are clear. Uh, already now, as of today, electric cars are the cheapest solutions for many consumers. And in a very, very near future, they will be the cheapest solutions for all consumers. And the second um, um, result that for me was really a surprise, and it is a little bit counterintuitive, is that already now, electric cars are the cheapest solution for the second hand and the third hand owners of an electric car. This is great news because this perception that electric cars are only for the rich people can be overturned by looking into the second and third hand market. In fact, it's the first owner who, who is hit by the, the high price uh, of purchase, sometimes helped by subsidies or tax, uh, fiscal policies. And he has to bear or they have to bear the um, the that the, the depreciation, but the running costs of electric cars are so low that in fact second-hand and third-hand owners are the beneficiaries of this. So um, this is really, and you will hear more about those results uh, by Element Energy and EFC later. Um, what I would like to say uh, as, a, as a conclusion for this uh, just warm up remarks, if I can say, there are in fact four types of benefits um, turning into electric cars for, from the consumer perspective. First of all, financial. So you, it will be cheaper for you to run a car when it's electric. The social dimension, meaning it's an inclusive policy because even the less affluent households or people can afford an electric car over its lifetime. Of course, the environment, we all want to contribute to uh, mitigating the climate crisis and electric cars lead to reduced um, uh, CO2 emissions. So that's good for the environment and it's good for health because Air pollution uh, is, a, is a major driver of public health uh, um, uh, crisis, uh, like uh, many, many diseases related to, to that. And so re reducing the air pollution is also reducing the pressure on public health systems and on, on your uh, uh, personal health. So there is a very, very, there are many good reasons to turn electric when it comes to cars, but st uh, still some barriers need to be overcome. But I would leave that to the discussion and let's see how we can conclude after this event, what needs to be done to even go more swiftly into the electric uh, car um, civilization, can I say so? Thank you very much. Thank you, Monique, for that, uh, that great scene setter for the rest of the event. Uh, Pascal, I'd like to speak to you now about um, basically, is this good news for the rest of the EU climate policy? You were hard at work last week, of course, um, finalizing the EU climate law. How does all this fit in together? Give us your, um, your perspective on this. Thank you. So uh, I, I would like to uh, first, uh, of course, say good morning to all. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, the bug, for uh, the conference and for the study, because it's a very, very interesting one in uh, terms of, I, I would say, the design of the study and, of course, leading to very interesting conclusions, uh, sometimes maybe even, as Monique said, surprisingly positively conclude, uh, sorry, surprisingly positive conclusions, but, of course, we need that uh, optimism. Uh, to move things forward. So um, we'll take this, uh, the results of this study uh, uh, on board and uh, I will uh, work with it uh, to uh, continue uh, to move uh, the Green Deal and uh, the uh, text on uh, mobility forward. So what's the, the, I mean, you know by heart the, the, the big picture, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on it. Uh, we are going to uh, change more than 50, 50, 50 laws, 50 European directives and regulations from now on up to the end of 2022. Not all of them will be agreed, finally agreed before the end of 2022, but all of them will be either agreed or under negotiation or launched by the Commission. So uh, when you change 50 laws at the same time, of course, you might end up with the systemic change we need. I say we might end up because each of these files will be a battle. And uh, one of them, uh, and it will be presented uh, in, uh, in June with the, the so-called uh, June package, uh, is one of them is directly impacting uh, the uh, deployment and the spinning up 
of uh, the electric cars. It's of course the standards, uh, the CO2 standards on cars uh, and then uh, on vans. And then a bit later on, on, on lorries as well. So the, this, uh, direct, this directive will be changed in June among a broader package of 10 directives and regulations that will be changed within this 50 uh, laws uh, package I was just mentioning, which is the, the concrete direct implementation of the Green Deal and uh, of the climate law we just agreed. So regarding the CO2 standards for cars, uh, what uh, the way the European law, as you know, is, is designed, we will not have a de jure end date of the commercialization of uh, uh, thermal vehicles, whether they are gasoline or uh, oil. But we might end up with a standard which will be ambitious enough, stringent enough to de facto lead to the end of uh, non-EVs non by a certain date. And I think this date uh, has to be 2035. Why? Because 2030 is very, very short term for the industry. And 2040 is too late regarding climate impact. So when you look at the, the lifetime of a vehicle, we need to stop in 2035 the, the selling of new uh, thermal or fossil based cars to make sure that by, we'd say, 2045, 2050, they are all out of the market, definitely. And then we can reach carbon neutrality. So 2035 is to me the right balance between uh, the climate objective, the industrial patterns and, and trajectories and the, so the, the management of the social consequences. Uh, because uh, we have to, of course, to be aware that there will be social impacts when we change the uh, all value chain of the car uh, uh, making uh, industry and we have to handle this properly. So uh, let's say a bit more than 10 years uh, 12, 4, 12, 13 years to do so is a real challenge, but we have to do so. So that's the main expectation I have from the proposal that will be put on the table by the Commission uh, in June, so in uh, just two months' time, uh, or regarding the CO2 standards, is to have a de facto end date in 2035. That's the first thing. The second one is how we make sure that we invest in everything we need to make that accessible, feasible on a very day-to-day -day basis. So, for instance, we need to have enough charging points. That's basic, but <laughs> it's a challenge we need to overcome. That's where other regulations uh, uh, are to be uh, changed. Uh, the one we have on the table is 10E regulation. It's about the financing of energy infrastructure. But you can easily argue, and that's the position which is growing in the parliament, that a charging infrastructure it's, is both, of course, a mobility infrastructure, but it's also an energy infrastructure because you have to connect the charge, uh, the charging point to the network and then to have a smart network to be able to deliver. Uh, so we want, as Parliament, we will very likely to have a majority to incorporate the financing of uh, these uh, charging uh, points into the 10E regulation in order to have access to other funds. So that's the kind of examples that we need to put together. And that's, for me, maybe the next step for uh, NGOs, civil societies, and of course for, for the legislators to, to work together meaning uh, not only to, to think in silos, but to say, okay, what we want is at the end of the day, 1% electric cars by a certain date. So my date is 2035. What do we need?
from now on to 2035 to get through that. And then we would have a consistent package, consistent from an industry perspective, from a financing perspective, from a consumer perspective, from a social perspective, and of course, that's the basic, uh, from a climate and health perspective. We have as well uh, the battery regulation, because uh, I guess Monique, you will get back to that, but uh, one of the challenges is to limit the negative impact on, on raw materials of the battery. So that's precisely why we have, what we have, sorry, the, the battery regulation that will make the battery much more circular, much less impacting for uh, the environment, both uh, uh, upstream, I would say, and downstream. That's part of the challenges we have to overcome, but it's already on the table and it will be uh, in the parliament uh, table now uh, in the coming days. So that's, that's enough for my side, but as uh, my, my mindset on this is precisely to work not text by text, text, by text but with a uh, encompassing vision of what we need uh, to get through that and to have a proper clean uh, mobility having uh, managed and succeeded in changing the whole value chain of the car making industry in less than 15 years time. It's a huge challenge, but I think we are very well placed to do it. Many thanks, Pascal. And I'm conscious of the fact that you have to leave us, but maybe one question before you do. Um, you mentioned how it's going to be a challenge to make sure that all of these various regulations and directives are all coherent. Do you think that the European Commission's smart mobility strategy that they published last year provides like the framework to keep all of these moving parts in one place? Or do you think that there are going to be real challenges uh, coming forward to make all of this coherent, to make sure that we have alternative and an energy structure, as you say, in the place that it needs? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the communication and the, the strategy and so on, that's, uh, it's fine. But what really matters is the legislative pieces. Uh, and and so that's why I will focus on the legislative pieces. Part of them are in the smart mobility uh, uh, strategy or communication. Uh, uh, part of them are not. And uh, another text I haven't had the time to, to, to even to mention and to refer to, but will have also an impact, uh, is the uh, a potential extension of the carbon market to the road transportation sector. That, will, that might happen uh, in June as well, at the same time that the Commission puts on the table the standards for CO2. And uh, that's where we need to look at it very carefully. The Parliament line is very clear. We have expressed it a couple of times already. First, under no circumstances, extension of carbon market to road transport could lead to less stringent stand, standard or less stringent increase of the CO2 standard. Because the real driver for change is the standard. That's exactly what we are seeing today. If we are now up to 20% of uh, new cells uh, being electric, it's precisely because of the standard, not because of the carbon price of something. So standards are first when it comes to driving the change. So if, if, if it's a trade-off between more stringent CO2 standards and a carbon price on road transfer through the extension of the carbon market, it's a total no-go for the parliament. Second, if the commission decides to go for that, then it means we will have to handle properly the social impact of it. Because as a French citizen, I can tell you that we are well placed with the yellow jackets to tell you that when you put a, car a price on carbon on gasoline and you do not handle the con social consequences for people that just have no choice, uh, no alternative, 100 kilometers to do to every day to go to commute uh, to, to get to work, then you have a price to pay, which is the social price and then a political price. So if the commission is to get to that way, it has to come with a very strong proposal to convince us that we will be able to deal with the social consequences of that. 
And again, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, we had before the, the Renew team, uh, Renew group yeah, last night, but she went to the other group as well, and I guess that she said the very same thing. Uh, she acknowledges yesterday that the Commission is still weak on this. That's the weakest part of the package, she said. So that it's very, very important that we uh, make sure that the proposal in June handles social risk properly if, if again, it goes to the extension of the market uh, price to the, the carbon market price to the road transport. Thank you, Pascal. Um, it seems to me that the emissions trading scheme reform will definitely be um, something to definitely watch in the summer, especially compared to the other legislative uh, items that will come out. I'd like to remind everyone who's watching that you can definitely ask your own questions to our panelists who will be coming up. Please use the Q&A function, uh, not chat, because we probably won't get to them otherwise. Um, at this point now, I'd like to introduce two uh, esteemed experts who will be able to talk us through uh, the study that you've already heard and maybe you've already seen online. Check it out if you haven't already. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Céline Cluzel, who is a director of Element Energy, who helmed this study that we've been talking about. Uh, she'll be able to put a lot more meat on the bones about the specifics we've already heard about. Uh, and after that, we'll be hearing from Melissa Cheviard, from, uh, the, who is European Institutional Relations Officer at the UFC Kershwazia, uh, who will talk us around the national specifics of uh, the studies and the numbers that we'll be hearing about. Uh, so Celine, over to you first for an overview of the research that underpins the study that we've been talking about. Uh, tell us more about uh, electric car ownership and what it means for the consumer. Hi. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everyone. So I've got a few slides that will come up. Um, first, Element Energy, we are constituency about um, 90 people fiercely dedicated to the mission of the company, which is accelerating the transition to a net zero world. And that means bringing everyone uh, in. So a study on the affordability of electric cars is exactly the kind of things that we like doing. Because I'm a director, I was given the privilege to present the study today, but I need to flag the credits for the work is really going to a few of my colleagues, ex and present colleagues, Tristan David, Richard and Lawrence in particular. Um, some of them are here today to help with the questions if needed. So what I will do first in the first slide is explain the scope of the study and then we look at five main results. So we looked at affordability, that means looking at cost. We looked at the total cost of ownership, TCO, that is an acronym that'll come up a lot. So let's explain that one first. The first element of that is depreciation, which is the buying price minus the residual value. And what we did here, I think, is a largest scale data analysis on that particular point ever done in Europe. We logged data on more than 9,000 models. So we looked at small, medium, large cars and many power trains, I'll see later. So we really, really be able to look at the trends um, around residual values across uh, the sizes, the, the prices and the power trains. The other elements, obviously, any tax that right, is on the purchase price, the cost of putting petrol, diesel, hydrogen, electricity in the car, and the annual cost of insuring and maintaining the car. We, um, as Monique explained, we looked at several countries, and countries come with specificities, so subsidies and particular taxes or discounts um, are, are varies uh, across these countries, so they looked at differently. But we also did a TCO at E level, so we ignore the specific country values. It would be meaningless to average across countries. And today I will present the uh, EU level uh, results, so no subsidies um, including in the cost. Um, but the, the next speaker will explain, um, will bring to life the different results across countries. So don't worry about that. The other point to make um, is that we really benefited from the fact that we had local experts from each of the countries we studied. Uh, people who could really scrutinize the assumptions we were taking uh, and all the, um, the values proposed there. So um, I take the opportunity to thank them on um, this. The other point about the method is the fact that when we do modeling, inevitably we have to choose an average value or value that we think is the most representative. It's not always the most interesting value or is sometimes come with uncertainty. So we did a number of sensitivities. Um, they're listed here and some sensitivities are uh, interesting only when we look at a specific countries. So I'll, I'll flag only a few today, uh, specifically e-fuels and the impact of mileage. Um, so that's it for the scope. Now I've got only five slides, one key themes on each slide, but they're pretty full slides. So just bear with me, listen to me and don't be scared by the graphs. So if we go to the first one, 
which is tackling the key question, um, are battery electric vehicles, BEVs affordable? Yes, Monique spoiled it really, she said it already, but I'll show you the numbers. Uh, this graph shows the EU average TCO over a lifetime of 16 years for a medium car. So that's the value on the Y axis and the X axis shows um, in which year the car has been bought. Um, so the first thing you probably notice is that there's outlier at the top, which is a hydrogen car, but even when they become mass produced, the cost will go down. The other thing you've probably been doing on is you probably look at which powertrain is the cheapest. Well, the cheapest is uh, the green one, which is the battery electric layer one. Interesting. The other um, uh, point you will notice is there's two blue lines, the plug-in hybrid, the PHEVs. If you charge it often, it's actually pretty competitive uh, at the moment. But if you don't charge it, which will not happen sometimes, especially if the um, process incentives are um, going a bit too far, uh, people might buy it because they're actually quite cheap. Um, but then if you don't, they don't plug it, their TCO is really not competitive. Um, so PHEVs are not automatically bad or not automatically good. Uh, something to watch for. The other thing you might notice is that the gap between the BEV and uh, petrol or diesel cars widens, not just because the BEVs are going down, but because the petrol and diesel cars costs going up. That is mostly due to the fact that they will have to be fitted with more, uh, more and more intricate um, emission system, emission filtering system to meet the EO emission standards. So now I think at this stage you probably think, well, she's not telling us anything new. We know uh, BVs are affordable if you look out over 16 years, but no one's buy a car for 16 years. So I'll say fair comment, but now on the next slide, I'll show you that this is still a valid result because if we go to the next slide, uh, as Monique already said, the, the cost benefit is for everyone, the first and the second buyer. So here I've taken a slice of the previous graph. So it's just 2020, but it's the same. It's 16 years uh, TCO. And the first day is the BEV is the cheapest, but it's split between what the, the new owner, um, which typically will own the car for four years, would pay. So you see 34,000 euros and compared to a petrol car. Uh, so that's about 7,000 euros cheaper than someone buying a new petrol car to own it for four years. But on the dark blue, you see the same story for people who buy a second hand car. Uh, so if people buy a, a five years old car to keep it uh, for a number of years, we'll pay um, 8,000 euros uh, less than if they were to buy a second hand petrol car. So that is a, a, the second big imp important point that it's not for just people who can afford buying new cars. Um, the affordability point is for everyone. And I did flag that here I was looking at EU level, not looking at subsidies. So you might think, well, if you have a subsidy for the first buyer, then Again, that's the first benefit. No, look in the detail in the, in the full report. We do demonstrate that even if you have um, a push price subsidy in place, the second hand buyer is still um, better off while buying an EV. So this, the next point on the slide is looking at the impact of mileage. So if we move to the next slide, um, the average mileage, you know, the average driver, if such a thing exists uh, in Europe, is 12,000 kilometers. So we look at the uh, X axis, that's where you got the kilometers. You found 12,000 kilometers, you get yourself into that, that line here, which is the first owner TCO, so just a four years. So at the moment, if you are this average driver driving 12,000 kilometers and you bought an EV last year, you probably actually worse off by 2,000 euros compared to buying a petrol car. Uh, if you don't have any subsidies. But as soon as you go up in mileage, you can see the advantage of TCO is substantial. Uh, at the top here, we've indicated typically how many people fall in this category of mileage. So there's not many people who drive a lot. Right? You, it's kind of like your job if you drive that much, if you drive more than 40,000 kilometers. However, if you look at, and I know this is shown on the graph, but the 25% um, highest drive, um, mileage driver uh, are generating 50% of the car emissions. So if EVs, BVs could be actually pushed towards the high mileage people, not only they get substantial cost savings, but we got um, substantial CO2 savings, which represented, uh, if you're like me, you have the speakers hiding the graph, you might not see it, but on the right today is um, uh, a scale that shows the CO2 savings, how much they multiply when you go on mileage. So there is that myth that 
EVs, I mean, that's probably an old myth, but people might still have in mind that EVs are small cars that should be used in city for people who drive not very much, which is like the group there. No, this couple of people will buy a second hand car, first of all. Uh, and actually that's not where you want brand new EVs to go for the reason I just explained. Okay, so that was the third theme. So the fourth theme, um, that's why I might accept some people based on the Q&A that I've seen already. I want to talk about e-fuel. So first, what is e-fuel? It's kind of a bit of a jargon that came up a few years ago. So if you use the concept of sensitive fuel, so it's a liquid fuel that can be used in petrol or diesel engine because <clears throat> the molecule is the same. <clears throat> but the starting point is typically hydrogen, which is made from electricity. Because electricity could be renewable electricity, the end fuel um, uh, can be clean in the sense it doesn't have a carbon footprint. Uh, but there is a lot of steps to go from uh, electricity to hydrogen to adding back carbon to create the uh, carbon, the carbon hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, molecule that you need. So that makes that fuel quite expensive. And that's what the first graph shows. Compare the fuel price, you see petrol and diesel, you're familiar with one, one and a half euros per liter, and then e fuel. So e fuels are not yet off the shelf. So we looked at scenarios. What well, if you have? Um, a e fuel made from electricity um, in the North of Baltic Seas? Um, and that's quite expensive, as you can see here, but almost three times more expensive than your, your fuel today. Or if you look at you know, the best case, where do you get really cheap renewable electricity? Well, Middle East. Like, what well, if you up was to decide that invest in e-fuels and rely on Middle East electricity to these e-fuels? That is still very expensive. You get, you're looking at late 30s to get price parity with special in diesel. So of course, once you take this optimistic, and I have to say these optimistic cases, they might not look optimistic because of the Delta, but they're optimistic. If you take these optimistic cases and put that in the TCO, of course the TCO is not very good. And that's what the graph on the right shows. Um, it shows that to start with, again, the same numbers than before. If you own a car for four years and you buy a BEV today, you're in the red, you're not as good as um, a petrol car for four years. But very quickly, the BEV line goes into the green side, which is you actually saving money. Whereas well, the e fuel um, car is never saving you money. And the gap between that and the BV is substantial. So here we're being polite on the slide, we're saying it's a risk of diverting, but let me let me be plainer now that I've got the gram in the microphone. E fuels for cars are a waste of time. You know, this is a message to take away. And I will add a dangerous waste of time uh, when it comes to cars. Right. Pascal has pointed out that there's enormous work, work to do. Uh, you said that more than 50 directives to change in the next few, uh, few years. That was going to take a lot of lobbying, reworking, redrafting. You know, there's enough work on the plate. Let's not waste time, um, a politician time in, in something that is doomed to failure, that will not bring cost reduction to, uh, to consumer, and direct the effort and investment for enablers, again, that Pascal mentioned, such as the charging infrastructure. Right. If you take only one thing away from this slide, uh, is that if you forecast a dangerous waste of time. Um, our last slide will be going back into the start of the conversation, which the um, policy tools that we have at our disposal, namely um, this huge target. So again, at the moment, the main policy tool is the fact that anyone selling cars in Europe have to achieve uh, an average CO2 emission across the sales. Uh, and this and this emission they have to achieve is here in red. So in 2021, 109 grams for the average mass vehicle. And then that doesn't change. We got a step change only in 2025 and then 2030. On this graph, what we've shown as well is a few lines, which um, are scenarios. We looked at what if we had sales of BVs that increased from today a few percent. Um, to 40% in 2030, or 60 or 80%. So gradually uh, increase. Obviously, in the case of 80%, they quite quickly have to go up. Uh, so if we look only at the 40%, what it shows that this data with achieves um, a new fleet CO2 that's significantly lower than what the target suggests. It means the target has really not pushing us any near, anywhere near a high BEV target. Pascal mentioned that. Ideally, we stop selling um, petrol and diesel car in 2035. But you don't want to wait 2035 to ramp up the sales. So you need to start very early. At the moment, the CO2 targets are not helping you do that. The, and to put things in perspective, the largest car seller in Europe, uh, the Volkswagen Group themselves, see that they want to have 60% of their sales um, being all electric in 2060. 
So again, um, clear message that the, the target could be revised um, to be more ambitious. The other point about that is not just lowering the numbers, but also maybe having something a bit more continuous. Uh, at the moment, uh, you could wait until 2024 to make an effort and meet your target in 2025 and again wait when actually we made all the points about affordability of EVs and the fact they're affordable for second-hand buyers as well, but the second-hand buyers are not going to get to these cars if they're not sold now. And again, thinking about CO2 emission accumulating in the atmosphere, we should save emission as quickly as we can. So again, that's my last message. Let's make the um, CO2 target standards more ambitious. Thank you very much for your attention all. Thank you, Celine. Uh, we'll be getting back to you, of course, in the little Q&A that we've got coming uh, in a few minutes or so. Before we get to that, uh, over to you, Melissa, to give us a sort of more in-depth perspective on the different member states that were mentioned as um, Celine's study looked at the EU picture. What can you tell us about uh, on a country by country basis? What are the specifics? Yeah, so hello, everybody. I'm Melissa Chevier, the EU policy advisor at BFC Cochrasir, so the French consumer organization. And so I will build on uh, what was presented by uh, Element Energy and present you the national results. So we're talking here about the economic results so for France, but also for the other countries who took part to the study. So the idea is to give you, um, to give you an idea of how, how we can use uh, these findings um, to um, um, how we, can, how we can give you this uh, concrete example, how these findings can be used, what they actually mean for EU consumers, what are the lessons learned, and how they can be used by policymakers. So I will present you some, uh, I hope, counterintuitive findings from this study. So first, that the EVs will be soon the cheapest power trains, that they present some significant economic advantages for low income consumers, and that they are particularly attractive for high mileage, rural and suburban drivers. And thanks to all of these findings, I will finally uh, present you some policy recommendations on how to encourage the market uptake. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the EVs, we usually hear that they are more expensive than other power trains. However, the study demonstrates that it's not true, especially in France. BEVs are already the cheapest powertrain over the car's lifetime for small and medium cars both today. So if you have a look at the graph, BEVs is the bottom line, the bottom green line, and we can see that it's very lower than the other one. And for France, it will also be the case for large cars from 2024. So this is earlier than the EU average, and we can explain it because of purchase subsidies, high average annual mileages, and fuel prices. Next slide, please. Myth number two is that BEVs are only for high-income consumers. But here again, our study demonstrates the contrary, because the eventual second and third owners of a BEV bought new today will access significant CCO savings. And we can explain it because of lower burning costs compared to ICEVs. So here I have some concrete examples for you. For the first one is about France. A medium BEV but new today will save over uh, almost 5,000 euros for its second owner of a petrol ICE. For a German pensioner with low mileage, driving a second-hand Renault Zoe would save 1,500 euros over the first five years. Let's go now to Slovenia. For a Slovenian family that will replace its second car by a second-hand BEV, it would pay 1% less than for a petrol ICE car. And finally, a resident of Vilnius using a home charging point would save 5,000 euros over five years by buying a second-hand Renault Zoe. Next slide. And the myth number three, BEVs are in priority for urban drivers. Here again, our results shows the contrary. High mileage drivers would benefit the most from switching to BEVs on a TCO basis. So that's why we think that they should be considered a top priority group for raising awareness because they can have the greatest savings. And uh, since they are driving a lot, they can also, they also have a big potential to reduce their CO2 tailpipe emissions. So now an example from Spain. A Spanish commuter driving over 30,000 kilometers a year 
can expect to save more than 14,000 euros over the first six years. And so what about Belgium? A Belgian commuter that drives a lot would save 6,000 euros over four years if owning a Tesla Model 3 rather than a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle such as a Volvo. But this is only the case if it charges its PHEV every day. However, we know that uh, it's not only the case, especially for company cars. And so if it doesn't charge it, the difference would be 16,000 euros. And finally, a German commuter driving a lot with a new Tesla Model 3 would have a 50% lower TCO than with a petrol ICE. Next slide, please. So thanks to all these findings, we are prepared some policy recommendations that we wanted to present to you today. So first policies that would maximize consumer demands for BEVs. The first figure that I show you about France were about the total cars lived. But sometimes um, electric BEV is not the cheapest for a train for first owner. And we need to change this because first owners determine the market stock mix and therefore the vehicles available for eventual used car buyers. So national authorities have a responsibility here because they can steer the market in the right direction. And so how they can do it? They can do it with well-targeting national incentives. This will allow to tackle the higher upfront costs for first owners, but also to accelerate the market parity and the development of the second-hand market. So if we take the example of the French carbon bonus, if you have a look at this graph, there is the upper red line that is with a carbon bonus. And the lower uh, red line is without. And so the zero line is the parity between petrol and BEV. And you can see that with a bonus uh, in 2021, today, it's already cheaper to buy uh, a BEV for the first owner. However, without the bonus, it will only be the case in 2025. So there is a difference of four years. So really important to have a nice, uh, a well-targeted national incentive. And uh, apart from bonus, we can also think about other incentives such as scrapping, scrappage scheme or conversion premium. So it's the fact that uh, if you get rid of your old polluting car, you can have a subsidy to buy a new one that is less polluting. And uh, this premium actually in France can be, currently in France, can be up to 5,000 euros for less affluent consumers. Next slide. Our second recommendation is to improve the BEV user's experience. And here, as it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Confin, there is a new opportunity with the revision of the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Directive. The general idea is quite simple. Charging an electric vehicle must, be cause, must become as easy as fueling a petrol car. So we need more and better charging infrastructure with easy payment methods and easily comparable prices per kilowatt hour. And beside all of this, we think that electricity providers should include BEVs in their offers and propose off-peak tariffs to consumers. And this is really important. We can see it with the Portuguese example. A Portuguese driver with a new Nissan Leaf with access to off-peak tariffs is expected to save 7,500 euros over the first six years while a low mileage driver with access to normal home charging tariff would have a similar TCO as a petrol ICE over the first six years. So we think that off-peak tariffs can be definitely a game changer. Next slide. And finally, we have a, a recommendation on the offer side. As it was also mentioned, we need to encourage car manufacturers to produce more electric cars. And here again, a new opportunity with the revision of the CO2 emission standards regulation. So we know that car makers have started a shift towards electric, and this is mainly due uh, to EU legislation on reducing EU CO2 emissions, on uh, reducing CO2 emissions. So if you have a look at this graph, you can see that in, 29, in 2019, uh, the CO2 emissions of new cars were going up, but there was a drop in 2020 because car makers had a target to reach. So it's written 107 
but um, actually uh, the target of 95 uh, was reached thanks to uh, flex, um, regulatory flexibilities. So we definitely need more stringent CO2 emission reductions targets for car. This will incentivize car makers to bring more BEVs on the market, and it will also stimulate the uptake and the growth of second and third hand markets. So if you want more details on all these policy recommendations, you can find them in the BELX position that has been published uh, yesterday. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Celine as well, that if we can sort of dig into a few of the details that you've both uh, presented really clearly there. Um, it's great how the total cost of ownership, of course, uh, is very um, advantageous towards uh, BEV potential motorists. Um, maybe you could give us a sense about when you look at what consumers want. Is TCO the only thing they consider or, or are there other factors at play here that um, dictate whether people will buy a certain type of vehicle, for example? Um, is it just about the money or, or are there more factors at stake here? Yeah, good question. See, what you say in the very popular way is, does it, does it really mean they're going to buy it? Yeah, and I agree, TCO is not enough. We don't a lot of consumer research actually. So um, I'm speaking from primary research point of view. Cost is the most important factor, but it's not the only one, especially in the case of electric vehicles where practicalities are important. However, um, I'm pleased to say there is a very in-depth study going on right now funded by the European Climate Foundation that's going to study the consumer behavior towards power trends in general, including electric vehicles. And that's going to be the largest ever study conducted. 14,000 um, new, new, new and nearly new car buyers across Europe, across seven countries, are going to be surveyed in a competitive way. Um, so for once, the study we just done is phase one saying, uh, EVs are cheaper, TCO, and the second study is going to answer the question, yeah, but would people buy it? And we're going to take all this cost and performance projection we just done from this study and marry that up with the, um, the, the measurement of how people trade off cost and driving range and access to infrastructure, differentiating slow local infrastructure, rapid urban, rapid unroute infrastructure to look at what will be the sales. Um, so stay tuned, I would say, um, towards the end of this year, you'll have uh, the full answer to that question. But as a short one now, I'm pretty confident from, from all the research we've done before that yes, consumers are ready to buy EVs. Um, if only we can address uh, for a lot of them the issues of charging infrastructure, especially in some countries that that problem is more acute than others. For instance, Spain have a very high rate of people who, who don't have any garage or driveways, for instance. So it's a long answer, but hopefully clear answer. And Melissa, just to you, I wanted to pick you up on a really interesting part, I thought, of, of your presentation where you showed that effectively in, in France at the moment, it's uh, more advantageous for someone to buy a new BEV than an ICE petrol uh, because of the carbon bonus and, and things like that. Um, so, so why aren't more people doing it? Or, or do you think that there are other obstacles that are stopping people from doing it? Is it an administrative kind of point of view? Do people even know about these, these perks and these schemes? Um, what needs to be the, the other kind of um, thing that links the consumers to these great deals that are going on? I think that uh, one thing is uh, what the study shows is that people are not aware that uh, they can actually save money by uh, driving this kind of car. So this is the first one. They are not aware of uh, the, the saving that they can, um, that they can get uh, by buying such a car. And then uh, there is uh, this uh, problem of uh, the infrastructure as well. That, is, um, that was also mentioned. Uh, people say, yeah, but uh, will I be able to ch charge my car uh, if uh, I'm uh, driving a, a long distance, if I have to do a long distance journey? So I think uh, these are, these, uh, are two um, elements that can explain uh, uh, that uh, some people are not doing it at the moment. But I hope that this study will help to uh, give them more information about uh, these opportunities. Is there a kind of, is there a potential role for uh, car manufacturers to really build this awareness as well to really you know make the most of this product that they're selling by making people more uh, aware that there's this great deal on offer for example or, or is it groups like yours that um, you know need to basically tell people that there are these perks on offer 
Yeah, I think that uh, car makers are definitely part of the solution and that uh, we should all communicate about uh, these advantages. And um, so, uh, Monique made a, a, a point at the beginning of the event actually about how rapidly the situation has changed with electric vehicles. The, the previous study in 2016, like she said, made it look like a kind of you know sci-fi option for for people like I don't know Elon Musk fans and this kind of thing. Um, have you built in this kind of um, assumption that the situation can change very quickly into the way that you've done this study, or, or is that kind of difficult to do to to predict the future? I know I know the answer is yes to that, but you know how are you afraid that like this becomes outdated quite quickly? Well, in a sense, I hope it becomes outdated and things improve even faster than what we say. But to pick on what has changed a lot compared to 2016, we see the, the supply and the many more uh, vehicles. But in terms of the cost projection, the cost of batteries has gone down even quicker than what pretty much anyone projected, I would say. The cost of ICE vehicles have possibly gone up. Uh, but in terms of outdated, you could have, you could like, I'll, I'll answer a question while answering your question. I'll answer one something on the, on the, the QA, right? Someone asked, What average price have we used? So we use the world alu price, etc., for residential, and we haven't assumed any off, off peak um, cost um, tariff reduction for electricity. So actually, you could argue we've been quite pessimistic for electric cars, and that could be one thing that becomes quite outdated quickly in that study because. Especially in the UK, we see a lot of innovation on tariffs uh, on that to attract people. And then that question as well, they ask, but um, not everyone charge at home, not all the time, and public charging is expensive, for instance. Um, and have we actually done a sensitivity on that? And we show that, yes, if people charge at rapid all the time, might be charging, that could delay the affordability point by about two years. You see a, a plethora of numbers and years in the report, but we look at this thing. So, that's an area that where things could go um, out of date. There's so many innovations, even, even on the ownership models, right? Um, at the moment, we looked at people buying a car, but remember the graph I was showing about mileage. Ideally, you tackle the high mileage, and high mileage are more about shared cars, actually, application like taxi. And it's a good thing, uh, moving away from private car ownership. Um, so yeah, hopefully the next study in two years time will be about the cost of uh, mobility instead of the cost of ownership. Um, yeah. I mean, like, what was the maybe one of the findings that you found most surprising, you know, even though you're, you're an expert in these things? I guess from my point of view, it was this kind of assumption that I'd always had that electric vehicles have been and maybe still are just for people who live in, in urban settlements in cities and so on. But it does appear to be from your study that you know, people who live in rural areas as well, because of the way that they use their cars can also benefit from this, you know, was there anything that really, oh, that's, that's not what I thought it was going to be, that was shocking that, that came out of this for you? Well, okay, um, you may don't see, but I've got quite a lot of white hair, so I've seen a few things before. <laughs> um, still, still, there was some surprising, for me, the most surprising thing was the contrast between member states, um, the disparity, and Lawrence made a very nice graph that shows the level of uptake versus TCO savings. And there's some outlier. You think if TCO, the higher TCO savings are your uptake, but there's some outliers here. And that really puts into contrast the fact that there's things outside of TCO that's important, namely the charging infrastructure. And again, Spain is something that come up as, you know, there's a lot of work there. And I know our selection of countries was very diverse. That was the point of it. But I was still surprised about how the outcome and the outlook can be diverse for um, for car buyers in across these countries. Yeah, that probably that would be the most surprising to me. Uh, but still, the message is positive everywhere. It's just maybe a little bit more work to do on the enabling factors in some countries. And maybe Thank you for me, if I may just. Please, yeah. Uh, I think the, the most interesting finding is that it's already interesting for less affluent consumers and uh, that it will be very interesting on the second hand markets. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Celine. Uh, thank you for both of you for your presentations and for your sort of insights into this as well. It's really interesting. Um, maybe you can both stick around for the rest of the event as well, if you can, in case there are any questions that come up during the next panel. Um, speaking of which, uh, and please, everyone watching at home, your questions are already coming in thick and fast, and we, we will get to them. Uh, keep asking away in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, our three panelists for the rest of the event. Uh, first up, we have Peter Doletti, who is Director of Mobility and Sustainable Transport at ASEA, the European Automobile Manufacturers Association. Uh, 
Uh, then we have uh, Julia Poliskanova, who is Senior Director for Vehicles and E-Mobility at tra uh, Transport and Environment, a clean NGO, clean mobility engineer. Uh, and then we have Daniel Mess, uh, a member of the cabinet of Franz Timmermans, who is, of course, uh, the European Commissioner and Executive Vice President uh, for the European Green Deal. Um, I'm going to head straight over to Petter, first of all, uh, to give us his thoughts on this study and um, basically what you think of this whole idea of electric car ownership. And then we will go to our next two panelists as well. Uh, Petter, floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, okay, I, I think I have uh, three or four pages of, of, of comments and, and ideas for what was uh, presented, so uh, enormously difficult uh, to, to structure that. But I think, of course, I, I leave aside the, the assessment of the uh, of the study, being an economist, uh, always you, you can play with the figures uh, and, of course, uh, so certain conclusions are interesting, but of course, depending on assumptions uh, that uh, I, I haven't seen, and of course, we all know that you, you can play with that how, how you want to. For me, the, the most important message is uh, that, that it clearly shows that uh, firstly, there's a move. Uh, and I think that I'm, I'm happy this is, this is recognized. And uh, definitely, this is not a, a question of, of a year or two. Uh, in case of our industry, uh, to, to develop a car, it, it takes six, seven years. Uh, so uh, it shows that if we have cars uh, today on the market that are delivered to the consumers, this is not something that, that started in, in 2019, uh, but really we, we have invested enormously in the past and, and now we, we are reaping the benefits. Uh, so, so this is something that needs to be definitely taken into account uh, for us. It, it's a really long run and we started in time when no one was talking here uh, about massive immobility. And I think um, the second point related to that, that this is a package. And, and I think that uh, what we did should be followed by, by the others as well. And speaking here especially about infrastructure because uh, uh, again now it's it's clear and proven that uh, the infrastructure is, is is the biggest bottleneck and from our experience okay uh, this is not a question uh, of, of a day or two uh, so even though uh, the infrastructure operators and uh, infrastructure providers would like to to let's say make the change they will not make it tomorrow it takes time uh, it takes time with the permissions it takes time uh, how, how to develop let's say the network etc so uh, then we feel a, a huge, uh, huge bottleneck uh, uh, that limits, uh, let's say, the consumer consumer uh, awareness and, uh, let's say, limiting uh, their concerns. Um, a third point that is related to that, and, and th this is for me uh, one, one of the essential parts uh, of, of the study, that of course, really, this is a package. You know, e-mobility is not only about, about the cars, it is about uh, environment, it is about infrastructure, it is about uh, incentives on, on the national and EU level. So we cannot see that just only from the optics that, okay, uh, we, we mandate uh, the manufacturers uh, to, to register cars. Uh, I, I think now thinking about this, the slides uh, from, from the French experience, you know, we, we are treated uh, according to registrations, which means the first user. And if I'm not mistaken, one of the assumptions of the study is that the first user is, is four years uh, usage. And if I, if I remember well, if I have a look on the French case, with a massive, uh, really massive financial contribution and subsidies, even after four years, uh, it's, it's still negative. Uh, and imagine this is only for, let's say, 10% of the registrations that we have today, how that will look like if we have 30 or 40%. So uh, we need to think about how to make uh, the, the whole ecosystem sustainable. Uh, what is working today from the side of the, of the interventions uh, and also uh, other taxes that are supporting the mobility. If, if I have a look, for example, in, in Netherlands, uh, in principle, 90% of the Teslas are company cars, and I'm pretty sure that the Dutch are very good in counting, uh, so they know why to do that, because uh, it pays them off. Uh, and, and from their perspective, the total cost of ownership might be very interesting, but that will not work maybe in other country. So um, we are also, from the policy perspective, uh, are really uh, dancing on a very thin ice, because uh, we, of course, have our uh, European targets and visions, but most of the, uh, let's say, critical elements uh, that are supporting immobility e are in the hands of the member states. And this is not related only to, to fiscal uh, and non-fiscal incentives, but uh, again, going back to infrastructure. So I'm, I'm very pleased that, that I listened that this should be one of the key priorities uh, within the European Parliament. We also hope that the Commission is moving um, in that direction as well, because again, for me, it's a package. It is about how to, of course, moving ahead with electrification from our side, and tightening the CO2 targets. Uh, and, and we clearly said so th this is doable, but we need to rely on infrastructure. And if it's not there, then it's enormously difficult. So for me, 
this is something that that we need to take into account when we talk uh, about about the next steps. Uh, of course, we we are in discussions with all the policymakers that uh, really, if we want to move to a certain date and phase out uh, whatever we call it, uh, then of course we all need to have a certainty that we have conditions that uh, we we can transfer into that, because that was one of the points uh, that was also uh, mentioned uh, by, by Pascal. It is about affordability, and of course. Uh, what, what is very cheap today might not be very cheap uh, in, in 15 years. And of course, uh, we can subsidize on, on one side uh, the products, the cars, or we can subsidize uh, the electricity. But uh, it's also fair to say that we, we have to all pay through that or the, the right uh, hand of the, of the coin towards the electrification and towards all the, let's say, investment that is made on the side of the infrastructure, on the side of the society and on the side of, of the manufacturers. So that, that were my first comments and quick reactions on the presentations. Thank you. Many thanks, Petter. We'll be obviously delving into the Q&A in, in a few minutes or so, so everyone get your questions in as well. Uh, Julia, over to you now. Um, I guess the results of the study are kind of music to your ears, really. It shows that uh, electric car ownership is getting cheaper, advantageous. Uh, that's, that's it, really. What else, what else do you want to say about it? Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, so um, a few points from, from my side, uh, th three points, really. I think, first of all, just overarching is to say that this is, this is an excellent and also a very timely study, just as key policymakers in the European Commission, but all across Europe are really gearing up about what the next set of climate measures should be. Uh, it shows that today already for first, but especially also for low income users, a myth that still persists and it breaks that myth that battery electric vehicle is the best option economically. And I think that's a very strong message. Um, the first point that I'd like to cover is actually to look a bit back to really stress and understand what is behind the affordable battery electric vehicles coming to the market. Uh, we criticize the European Commission a lot on many things, but this is where we should actually applaud and say something really great because the, the, this is the result of the European vehicle CO2 standard, especially the car CO2 standard we have in Europe. This is just to really understand what it does by it actually pushes the car industry to invest, to scale up the production of electric vehicles. And it's that scale that you cannot achieve just by slapping a carbon price on everyone, but it's that scale of the car CO2 standards that is pushing car makers to invest in things like platforms, like Volkswagen and others are doing. It's pushing to invest in huge battery electric uh, supply as well. So the battery cells, so it drives down the cost. And I would argue here that from what we have seen, the real investments to meet the 2020 targets were being made in 2017, 18 and 19. So not at all the six or seven years uh, Petter was just mentioning. In 2015, we were busy arguing whether it's the efficient diesel or electric car, which is better for the environment. So it is moving much faster today in today's supply chains than, than what we think. Um, it's really important as well that the CO 2 standard is really the one that is targeting the right social structure of the car market. So it targets the first market, companies buying vehicles, corporate users, people who can just afford the first car. But then importantly, why, why when these people bought those cars, a few years later, they're available as secondhand market. And it's really impressive in the study how it really stresses the importance importance uh, of secondhand users benefiting from these vehicles and to give them those vehicles. We need uh, higher and more ambitious CO2 standards in the first place. So what shall we do? I very much agree with a uh, with, um, very strong and excellent summary of, of Celine also and, and of the recommendations in the study. We need to increase the car CO2 standards to get more battery electric vehicles in Europe. Uh, just raising 2030 target is not enough. We will see benefits of it in January 2030, and we will miss the 2020s, and we will fail our consumers. I know that there's so many proposals and, and, and regulations. Mr. Confan said 50 legislative acts the one thing to prioritize within the car CO2 review, it's ambition pre-2030, that's what matters. And a few, uh, two more quick points on, on costs. Uh, another point I wanted to raise is around plug-in hybrids. 
us as environmentalists, we show a lot how environmentally this is not the solution to go. I think what is really interesting from this study is that it also shows that economically for consumers, for drivers, this is not the option to go. And it's not just about charging. This is really, really at the bottom of the fact is that it's too expensive powertrain, so it will remain being an expensive vehicle. And uh, because the vehicle is often not designed to be driven in zero emission mode, it has a small battery, heavy car, small and weak electric motor, most of the time you're relying on an engine, which means you pay for, for, for petrol. And I will only say here that in our tests, we tested three plug-in hybrid vehicles. We saw fuel efficiency. So the amount of fuel used is uh, in, in when the vehicle is in, in engine mode around 10 liters per 100 kilometers. Can you imagine that? You need 10 liters per 100 kilometers. That's not the fuel efficient option for, for consumers. And my last point is, is around this new fake solution that some in the, in the oil industry and some others are bringing, and this is around e-fuels. Again, I think the study is very strong about that. Um, just to mention quickly that tomorrow we will also release our study looking specifically at the environmental and economic credentials of e-fuels. But this study here today and our analysis all shows the same. Even in 2030s, using uh, synthetic petrol in petrol cars will be more expensive than going for secondhand or new battery electric cars. It's not a solution for new or the existing market. We need synthetic fuels for aviation, for shipping, like e-kerosene, for example. But in the road transport, it's not e-fuels, it's e-fools. And they will only be a sideshow and delay electrification. So don't make the mistake of adding fuels. Don't reward plug-in hybrids in car CO2 standards. Drive what consumers need, and these are battery electric vehicles. Thanks, and I look forward to the questions later. Thank you, Julia. Uh, you know, when you come up with things like e-fools, you're putting journalists like me and headline writers out of a job, right? You need to keep some of the creativity for us. But um, uh, Daniel, turning over to you now, um, European Commission has got a lot of work ahead of it this year. I imagine a study like this that links policy to consumers is something that's really of use to the European Commission, helps you sort of make these policies more applicable to everyday people. Um, what's your take on it? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Sam, and also to uh, the others and for Berg for organizing and also for this uh, for this study, because um, I agree that this study is uh, not only important to inform us on uh, the decisions we will, will be uh, proposing uh, uh, before uh, summer, but also like uh, to make really general political points, because this could be really an area to shift to uh, clean cars and especially electric cars. This could be an area where climate action is also a winning proposition for consumers and uh, ultimately also for future jobs in, in Europe. And uh, that is always a nice thing to see when you work for a, a politician and uh, uh, about to make a, a proposal. So in that sense, this study is really important and we should uh, take a good note uh, of it. And uh, we will, of course, uh, because some have said it already, I think that, that it is an interesting finding that electric cars are already the most affordable option uh, not only for the coffee latte drinking people in Amsterdam or in uh, Copenhagen with the high earnings, uh, but also for the commuter in Spain or um, the uh, even the secondhand car buyer in in Lithuania. So these findings, we will carefully look at them, and because these will be indeed uh, important uh, to guide our decisions. And I would agree with previous speakers that when you see what we should take from this, also when we um, uh, prepare our decisions, is that. Uh, we uh, are grateful for the confirmation that that indeed the a if not the main driver of this change to make it more affordable uh, uh, electric cars for consumers has been the, the CO2 standards, which indeed we will be revising and of course we will be revising them to make them more ambitious. Um, that is really good finding that uh, that, uh, that 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 is confirmed by uh, by, by by what we're seeing. Um, the, on the CO2 standards for cars, uh, of course, the services has, are is assessing the impact of, of such a proposal carefully, but they're also already in the phase of designing uh, the legislation. So um, that is also like already a, a signal to uh, uh, to give uh, today that that has uh, uh, started. And uh, of course, we will uh, make sure that whatever we do is ambitious because you see that uh, Pascal Canfin and other important people in the parliament will uh, watch us uh, closely on that. I think that... Um, one point, picking up point, that also um, uh, better from from Asea made. I think that we are very much aware of of, of the challenge of, of the of the charging points, uh, because indeed a, a consumer can take a figure on total cost of ownership and fuel savings, 
Uh, but ultimately, we'll also take a decision based on like, you know, when I walk in my street, do I see that actually charging points are available? Do I have the comfort that a charging point could be available at, at my workplace or at my home? Uh, and with the right uh, uh, energy grids uh, behind it to, to, to make the charging possible. I think that that is really an important issue and one that we're taking very, very uh, seriously. I think that the way that we look at it now is that our ideal objective would be to make sure that um, the targets uh, for, for member states to roll out uh, charging points and the CO2 performance standards really work in a tandem and really in parallel. So not one after the other, uh, but really in, in, in parallel to make sure that both are ramped up uh, in this crucial decade, I would say, for, for clean mobility. So both the CO2 performance standards and the rollout targets, because I think that the AFID, so the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive, uh, should go a bit beyond uh, the, the fact that it should be easy to use. It should also really help us achieve these Green Deal targets. It should help us to actually make sure that the charging points are there, that there are enough of them uh, to cater to the cars that will come to the market, also on the higher uh, CO2 performance uh, uh, standards. And uh, one one option that 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 services are of course uh, looking at in that sense is to you know you could you could for instance have a start look at the registered uh, uh, electric car fleet in, in in a certain country and then say well how can I extrapolate from that to see which charging points I I need so colleagues are really working very seriously uh, on that to see how you can find that that right benchmark that right uh, metric uh, but the parallel development I think is is, is the one to uh, want to watch out for. So we are taking that very uh, seriously and to include a bit on, on, uh, on, on some of this, also picking up on something that uh, uh, Pascal Caffin said, uh, sure, this is a question of like which, which proposals the commission ultimately makes and the regulations, but it goes far beyond that. I really see, and this study is one, uh, one, one, one branch at that tree that, that we've been seeing already, that this is also where the businesses and the markets are heading. They are heading towards uh, electric mobility. I take the point uh, that uh, um, that uh, some of this has, has taken some time. But when you look now, uh, you know, and better also saying we can work with higher ambition levels on the CO2 performance standard. That, that's quite a change compared to when we proposed the original CO2 performance uh, standard. But it's 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 difficult nowadays to catch up to all the announcements that the car makers are making themselves, uh, uh, represented by 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 ASEA. Uh, the, that they're making themselves on the ambition to have electric cars, you know, uh, that the, the 70% uh, by 2030 for, for Volkswagen, 90% for other car makers. Renault is breaking into certain crucial markets with car models that are also affordable for the people who, who can drive shorter ranges in, in, in smaller cars. So a lot is happening. Uh, so it is not only about the regulations, the business and the markets are also heading in that way in the investments. And I think that uh, also to quote Pascal and what he said, you know, some of this may, may be a battle, like proposal for CO2 performance standards. It, I think it would be a bit, we are in a different situation already compared to when we made the original proposal, um, but it's a battle to be had. I think that that, that is uh, something that this study confirms that if this were to be a fight, it's a fight to be had, but I would rather prefer that this turns into something of a bigger transformation plan because it is absolutely right that target setting is not enough. You need to make sure that this transformation actually happens and you need to have really an overall game plan uh, not only in the field of like infrastructure and energy grids and transport to make sure that everybody has the comfort that they can drive freely. A car is freedom for people, so they need to feel the comfort that they can drive freely somewhere and, and, and charge the car. Um, it, 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 it's about that, this, this big, big transition. And of course, also all the workers in the automotive supply chain who uh, also need an honest story from us and need to prepare for a, a transition and we need to help them um, with whatever we can with a, with a game plan. So fights worth having, but I rather prefer indeed a big uh, transformation plan. And I think that that is also uh, something that the commission uh, uh, subscribes to. Thanks, Daniel. Um, one gets the sense sometimes when you when you look at sort of commission policy making uh, the CO2 targets um, and so on, um, that it's primarily geared towards uh, new vehicles, new cars, new buyers, um, not completely, but that seems to be the majority kind of share. Is it interesting then to see how the study um, approaches the fact that the second hand car market will benefit from this as well? You know, how, how much is the commission looking into how all of these you know, benefits trickle down basically to the next level of ownership? Is that something that work is already being done on? Yeah. Well, first of all, it shows that like uh, uh, the new car sales, uh, if you if you, if you have higher targets on your C two performance standards, it does trickle down also to to second car users. My expectation is also like you know if you see you know my expectation is also that that actually the the lower income households 
the benefit is also could be relatively speaking even bigger because fuel savings are a bigger proportion of their wallets uh, than 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 for many of the the high earners. So relatively speaking, it could be a very interesting uh, proposition. So it's again an encouragement to, to think ser seriously about our CO two standards, but it's also an encouragement to. Indeed, as Julia also said, to have a close look at um, those markets where uh, change can happen relatively quickly. And I think that company uh, car fleets is an interesting area to look at, not only because of um, uh, the companies uh, uh, buying bigger uh, fleets, but also because um, the, um, the change over times are quicker there. Like a, a company car can switch hands, you know, after three years uh, already rather than uh, longer. So if you start there, you, you actually boost the secondhand market pretty closely. So that is also a message that we're also giving to member states when they talk about their uh, recovery plans, have a watch out for this, for these for these company car markets. And we see some encouraging things happening. Uh, Belgium, uh, the country where um, I live in at least, and perhaps a lot of these uh, calls, like talking seriously about a tax reform uh, and other reforms for the, for the corporate car segment to make sure that we have more of these electric uh, company cars uh, on the streets, very, very, very good that that is being uh, discussed. Very promising developments in in France. Uh, you see in 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 the UK that uh, that leadership is also taking that field. So that is something that we definitely uh, are taking up also with uh, member states and the recovery plans and uh, encourage. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Peter, you mentioned how um, member states are the ones that are going to have to do a lot of the hard work in terms of infrastructure and subsidies if needed and, and things. And, and Daniel just mentioned the recovery plans. Do you have big expectations there for you know, the likes of Germany, France to really um, go beyond and push forward with rolling out more infrastructure, be it electric, hydrogen, whatever? Well, well we hope so. <laughs> uh, but I think, as, as Daniel mentioned, uh, exactly those... Uh, you know, and, and also related to, to the total cost of ownership uh, from, from a longer term perspective, definitely we agree that uh, uh, the, the benefits for the second or third owners are, are, are great because all the hurdles and all the system that should be, let's say, fine tuned, this is up to us. This is up to, to first registrations according to which we are treated as manufacturers. It is about exactly uh, different taxation schemes and supportive measures for, for the fleets that can really turn uh, the, the amount of vehicles in a much quicker way, which of course then provides the benefits for, for, for the second owners. So they are really the critical ones. And um, we had several discussions also with the Commission and with also our national associations. These are the critical elements that really can make the change because really this is, this is a national competence. Uh, let, let's be very frank, uh, without those changes, uh, that are supporting uh, the, the transition and a switch uh, on, on the national level, we, we cannot move on, on a European one. So, so for us, this, this is uh, absolute priority and, and, and definitely uh, we are working on that. Uh, and then of course, we, we have the tools uh, that, uh, that can help on a European level. I think AFID was, uh, was uh, mentioned here several times where you know very well that, uh, okay, uh, for me being a very liberal person, uh, asking the commission to regulate a couple of years ago, that was a challenge. But in principle, it was the only way how, how we as industry were able to, to, let's say, echo exactly the question of the charging infrastructure. And we requested already at that time, I think 2014, the mandatory targets uh, from, uh, from the commission. It was proposed, it was watered down enormously, and, and we have AFIT uh, directive as it is today. And it's toothless, and exactly after, after a couple of years, we are struggling with the, uh, with, uh, with the infrastructure. So you have definitely mentioned and noticed that uh, uh, we are teaming up with, with Julia and, and her team and jointly we are asking for, for really very ambitious and binding targets for the member states because it is a, a one of the rare tools on a European level where we can tackle those issues that are really hindering the development of the e-mobility. And just turning to you, Julia, one of the accusations that's get, that gets thrown at electric vehicles, and it's one of the questions actually in the Q&A, is the, the life cycle assessment that um, it takes, you know, you used to drive a certain number of hundreds or thousands of kilometers in an EV to reach the same greenhouse gas output as uh, an ICE car because of the, the more emissions that are supposedly emitted during the manufacturing process. Uh, and the question here from uh, my namesake, Samuel, says... Uh, uh, it's completely omitted in the current legislation. How can this be fixed? Um, is this something that's changing rapidly as well? What what can we expect there from um, policymakers or even just the real world industry? Um, thanks, Sam. I mean, that's one of these myths that that keeps on keeps on giving and keeps on living. From the life cycle point of view, there is a number of robust independent analysis that have negated this argument now for years on a life cycle basis. An electric vehicle 
today, in fact, on last year's electricity in Europe, is already three times better than, uh, than, than a diesel or an engine vehicle. So it's better, battery electric vehicle is better. We are now looking more into the various alternative options. And for example, in that study we'll release today, you will see that we, for the first time, will also have done a life cycle analysis compared to e-fuels. And there as well, the battery electric vehicle on EU grid electricity is around 40% better. So let's just put it to rest. And there are still, if some people are still wondering why these myths keep appearing about life cycle emissions, I just recommend looking into the Aston Gate scandal in the UK, just, just to understand it better. Um, I would like to really stress that it's also really not correct to say that we are not targeting all life cycle emissions in Europe. We're just not targeting this in one regulation on car makers, because car makers, guess what, don't control the entire economy and society of, of, of the world. They can't just make decisions about something that happened somewhere else. We are controlling fuels in the fuels regulations. Renewable energy directive is the place for that. We are looking into the batteries, which today sometimes is uh, still an issue that needs to be improved around battery electric vehicles in the dedicated battery regulation. So tailored approach to the right sectors and overall as a framework we're covering life cycle. I'd like to make a quick point on infrastructure as well, if, if I may, uh, both Daniel and, and, and Peter talked about it a lot. Um, indeed, we're teaming up with, with ASEA, also with Wake and others. We think it's very important in the growing market to ensure seamless infrastructure Infrastructure. And there is a real opportunity with AFI law, with infrastructure law coming in June. I would really stress, especially what we're talking about here a lot in the study, the benefits for second-hand uh, users of EVs. These people still need charging infrastructure. So this, if there's one thing where European laws can specifically help, is to place binding targets on all the member states. We actually don't worry so much, to be completely honest with you, with the Netherlands or Germany. The governments, they're already doing a lot. But in a lot of Central and Eastern European countries, Southern countries, where the first EV market is not yet as big, we sometimes keep forgetting that we still need charging for the second-hand EVs. So giving those member states binding very ambitious targets is important to make sure that every European can benefit from an electric vehicle, not only people who buy new cars. I guess another another recommendation on the, the life cycle point is uh, don't buy a Tesla with Bitcoin as well. It's another thing. Um, I just wanted to call, call back to this point that Pascal made right at the beginning, Julia, about how he thinks that um, 2035 should be this cutoff point for a de facto to ban on the ICE engine. Um, what are your what are your, so, your thoughts on those two things, that it should be de facto and that it's 2035? Are, are either of those things sufficient in your view or, or tell us what you think? EU-wide, if we want to meet the ambitions of the European Green Deal, and if we look at the average lifetime of a car, 2035 is the latest date at which Europe should set phase out of diesels, petrols, hybrid vehicles uh, as well. It's really important to set that signal because we're not only changing the car makers. Some car makers are already voluntarily changing themselves and going for full electric. We are changing the entire supply chain. We need to send a signal, charging, batteries, skills, all of that takes time. So setting now 2035 allows us all to work together. However, a lot of segments, countries, cities can go much sooner. Cities should all be phasing out engines by 2030. Countries like the Netherlands, Norway, even Western European countries don't need to wait until 2035. In fact, they can go sooner. And of course, some parts of the market, urban fleets, higher mileage fleet, company cars, all need to be there before. But EU-wide, I would agree with Pascal that 2035 is politically feasible, the latest date at which we should be doing that. And just turning back to you, Daniel, on, on this idea of, you know, making sure that this isn't just the Northwestern European um, cleanup of mobility, this is an EU wide exercise. Um, how, you know, what are the kind of ways that we can prevent it from just being uh, the Netherlands, Norway, whoever, um, getting on board with electrification and cleaning up transport, and also making sure the likes of Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia are also on board with this. Is it is it purely an infrastructure thing? Um, again, is this the recovery plans? This is the moment to make sure everyone's on the same page. Where, where do you see the real kind of um, moments for you know success? 
Yeah, like, but the, the, the infrastructure is, is, is an important part of it, but also the boost to the second hand market that we've already been discussing, because indeed, in reality, it's it's the second cars that, that go there the earliest. And if you look at uh, at least uh, what the study of uh, that we're discussing today seems to confirm is that uh, we can already see uh, quite uh, some uh, movement going in that direction in the next decade. And I also think it's an interesting finding in that sense to, to I think that we all need to reflect a bit on about that, that further. This finding indeed that the e-fuels uh, are only uh, competitive by 2037, and afterwards, because at the same time, we will see the second hand the hand market developing already and all these uh, second hand electric cars going into uh, into other countries. So that is something that we need to, uh, I think, reflect upon that uh, that finding. Uh, but the infrastructure issue is, is, is clearly uh, an important one. And uh, you can do that in different ways. Uh, uh, just respect the fact that everybody has a bit of a different starting point there. And that's why, for instance, uh, looking a bit at the possibility to see a bit what is what is really the electric car fleet that will be registered in a certain country to can we take that as a starting point for the charging infrastructure that you need that's already uh, you, you can already then take account of different starting positions in different member states because it will be different in the netherlands there will be far more of them than uh, than elsewhere but it's important to get it right uh, uh, in the in the next decade of it to make sure they can they can catch up as quickly as uh, as possible given the fact that second and second market uh, cars are coming their way and that's why I think that also whatever we come with uh, in terms of uh, the target setting, and I can comfort Peta and Julia that we are looking at these, you know, possibilities for these more stringent uh, national uh, targets already announced in the mobility strategy, uh, by the way. But I think it also needs to come with a bit of an uh, investment uh, roadmap. So in a bit of a, a, a plan of which type of funding would be available in which regions uh, to make sure that uh, some of this can, uh, can happen. And if we also can have a start already at the core highways, at least in Europe, you can also uh, make, a, make a break into uh, connecting uh, Europe in, uh, in, in, into the future. Thanks, Daniel. Um, unfortunately, as with all events, uh, time has run out to some extent. Um, so just a few concluding remarks from me to see um, you know, what we've learned today. Um, total cost of ownership, it's changed remarkably since the last time studies on this were done. Um, as Pascal Canfin said at the beginning, uh, and factors like emissions trading schemes and rolling out to road transport, this has to be really thought about carefully. Um, Factors like e-fuels, hybrids, perhaps are not as financially advantageous as the industry says they might be. Uh, the recovery plans are going to be a big opportunity for uh, member states to uh, get infrastructure rolling. And of course, the huge um, review of legislation coming this summer, CO2 targets, standards are going to be absolutely key in uh, cleaning up transport, basically. Um, now we're going to turn back to Monique. Again, you've heard what everyone's had to say. You've seen the study presented to the public, not just in a press release. Um, tell us how your thoughts on this event have gone. What do you think is now the next steps and, and what can we expect from the future of um, consumer? Well, maybe first, thank you very much. It was a, a, an amazing uh, discussion. I really uh, liked it very much. First, a very practical takeaway from for all of those who have uh, attended the, the, uh, the, the event. Uh, don't waste your money on plug-in hybrids. Huh? So that's already a very practical uh, advice that we can give to consumers in that room. And also, I, I like very much uh, the move from e-fuel to e-fuel. Uh, so this is something uh, that we might also uh, keep in mind. I think that we all agree that then there is a huge need for stricter emission standards. Uh, this is uh, a no-brainer. This is that the 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 regulation that is going to certainly drive the market uh, uh, towards more electrification. What I also very much, uh, and, but it's also like a global, uh, it's not only about stricter emission standards. And one of my takeaways also, and a message to the commission, maybe to Danielle, is to say um, ASEA, transport and environment, and Berg agree that we need better charging infrastructure. So if that's a common request from the different uh, stakeholders, that would maybe be a very important message to take to the, to the policymakers. Um, and there, but there is more than charging infrastructure. Like Pascal said in the beginning, it's also the whole energy infrastructure. Charging is only part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the equation and also the battery. Huh? So, I mean, the pressure on the raw materials needs also to be tackled. So a lot has to be done. So a, a huge to-do list when it comes to regulation, but also there is uh, more work to do, not only for the regulators, you have the national authorities, of course, they need to have fiscal policies that support the first owners uh, to get into um, buying an electric car. The markets, it's the car industry who has, of course, they have to get their act together. And I, I very much welcome that it's being done for the moment. And also the whole supply chain has to follow. And can I say uh, from the consumer organizations, we have also our homework to do. 
we need to go on debunking the myths about the high cost of, of electric cars and we need to communicate to people that it's, it's a, it's a win-win, a, a, a quadruple win-win to engage into uh, electric cars. So I, I thank all of you very much for your uh, very, you know, spontaneous uh, reflections. It was not a, like a presentation style. I thank very much also Element Energy and UFC Kishosia for their very good slides. I think a lot of um, lessons to be learned and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Um, yes, here's the close of the event. Unfortunately, we didn't have too much time to go into the panel at the end, but this is going to be, I'm sure, the first of many events delving into this extremely complex and broad subject. Uh, thank you, Monique. Thank you, Pascal Canfin, for joining us at the beginning. Celine and Melissa for explaining the slides and the studies and the findings very clearly at the beginning and answering questions about that. And then Petro, Julia, and Daniel for contributing to the panel at the end. Uh, very interesting discussion, and there will be more to come on this. Uh, check out the study online. If you haven't already, you can finally see what we were talking about. Um, and look out for further work on this coming soon. And thank you very much for tuning in and have a great end of the week. <laughs>